Hey, buddy, how you doing, Brian? You doing okay? Well, good evening. It's good to see you tonight. Thank you for uh, being with us for our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and prayer time. Uh, we appreciate, we know that uh, this time of uh, the year is pretty much a, a busy time for most people, but thank you for, for taking time out to, to come to the Lord's house for a little bit tonight to study about Him and uh, to read His Word together. And uh, I got a song for you. I don't think I've ever played it. I've listened to it a bunch of times. But I've, I've made the statement, I'm sure, many times that the Bible is God's love letter to us, his people. Now, he loved us and sent Jesus for us. He gave his word to us so that we could be saved and teach us how to live for him. And this is actually God's love letter. There's a song uh, that the McCamish sang talking about that old love letter. So, Brother Tim, you play that for us if you would this time. <clears throat> I found an old love letter that was written just for me. It told me how much I am loved, sweet and tenderly. With a broken heart, I read each line of God's love for me. It was written by a nail-scarred hand at Calvary. Oh, how this old love letter spoke to my heart and soul. I was captured by every word as I watched his love unfold. With special care, he wrote it down for all the it was written by a nail-scarred hand at Calvary I found the old love letter, the pages stained with red I am yours eternally, is what the postscript said I treasure my letter that he nailed upon that tree My tears stain its pages every time I read Oh, how this old love letter spoke to my heart and soul I was captured by every word as I watched his love unfold With special care he wrote it down for all eternity It was written by a nail-scarred hand At Calvary Oh, how this old love letter Spoke to my heart and soul I was captured by every word As I watched his love unfold With special care he wrote it down For all eternity it was written by a nail scarred hand at Calvary. With special care, he wrote it down for all eternity. It was written by a nail scarred hand at Calvary. Amen. Most people never understand. What a great book this is. When they see heaven, maybe we'll understand it a little better. Those that see hell will understand it a little better. And realize, as that song said, that it was written for all eternity. It's, not a, it's been here since... Since God created and God made it, and He wrote the, made the authors that wrote it over a period of some fifteen hundred years, and, and no mistakes whatsoever in it. And I'll never 
We get over the fact where God says, don't add anything to it, don't take anything away from it. One of the things that is wrong in the church world today is we have ruined the Word of God by putting our own thoughts and ideas into it and saying, instead of saying like the old time preachers used to say, thus saith the Lord. That's what people need to hear. Not thus saith what Jimmy says, but thus saith what the Lord says in this book right here. And if Jimmy is wrong, he needs to be called out on it because it's what's in the book. And we need to, I think we need to be a whole lot more particular with it than a lot of people are in the day and time we live in. But anyway, that's enough. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn. We're going to move on to our next lady. I told you I was going through a little study of the great ladies of the Bible. When you read the Bible, and of course we're in the book of Hebrews, well, we'll be in the first of the year when we get back uh, through the Christmas season. One of the greatest, most famous chapters in the Bible is found in the book of Hebrews. And that is the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. In that 11th chapter of Hebrews, it's known as the book of the heroes of faith. There are many men and women that are listed in that book. And the Bible says about every one of them that's listed in that chapter that they all lived by faith. Well, in that chapter, I should have took time to count them up, but I didn't. How many? 23 people? How many women? How many women? Probably not many. I didn't count them either. But uh, those are people who are with, most of them well known, some of them not so well known, are never were famous here, but in heaven, they were well known. Of all the people that lived on the earth during this time, these 23 people were mentioned in this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Now, one of the ladies that is mentioned in this book that we'll be talking about for the next few weeks is a lady named Sarah. Sarah is mentioned in, in the book of, of faith. She is uh, in the Bible known as a woman of faith. Now, we've all heard this saying many times, and that is this that behind every great man is a great woman. I've heard that all my life. Now, a woman's part in a home and in a family and a life with her husband and her children are very typified in the life of Sarah. Now, if you remember this, if you read your Bible, the Bible will have more to say about this woman than most all other women that are in the Bible. Of all of them was this lady, Sarah, who is here. Now, when we study the Bible and we study the lives of people, Sarah's husband was a man named Abraham. Now, we, they're both famous for, for what we'll talk about a little later on another night, but what happens is they were not Jews. Uh, they were not Israelites. Matter of fact, when you go and you look at the life of this lady and her husband Abraham, they were actually what we know and in the Bible as Chaldeans. Or later on, the Chaldeans became the Babylonians. Now, we've studied a lot in the last year about the Babylonians, haven't we? Those were the Great enemies of Israel one took them into 70 years of captivity and all that. And then you move on to where we live today. It was the Chaldeans. It was the Babylonians. And now the land that you and I know as Iraq used to be the Chaldean homeland. So it has existed even though the peoples have changed. That land has existed for a long time. Now the first man to be called Israel was a man named Jacob. Now, Jacob was Abraham's grandson. You go see a pattern here as we go through this. 
their grandson, great-grandson, would be a man named Judah, whose name the Jews were named after. So as we hear the story of Sarah, a little bit about Abraham, but mainly we'll dwell on her for, for the next little while. They were yet not neither Jews, nor were there Israelis. They were Chaldeans. They were pagans. That's who they were. When God, God chose them and called them, but when God chose them, he told them what? That he would make a new people. That he would uh, make his own people, and God made Abraham and Sarah or Abraham mainly, but Sarah's wife, a lot of promises about what would happen to that chosen people that God would choose, and they would be called the people of God. Now, the thing you'll find, that no matter how great she was, nor how great he was, they were both flawed. And you can say that about any man or woman in the Bible. We all have shortcomings. The greatest people, Paul, you go who you ever think is the greatest in the Bible, but everybody at some time in their life has their own flaws. But yet, even though they were flawed, Abraham and Sarah, God was able to get them because of how they responded to him later on into that hall of faith that is in the Bible. And so as we look at this, we see a lady of faith. Now, you got to understand something. And, and, and we've, you've heard this all your life, probably if you've gone to church, that in the Bible times, women were really second or third class citizens, weren't they? That's just who they were. That... That was the time that, that they were brought up in. Uh, that's who they were. They, that's, that's the culture that they were. Now, you know, the saddest thing about that is we live, you know, back, I, I don't know how many years it was ago, but I remember probably it might have been 40 years ago. I don't know. When this women's lib thing become the lock of land where Everybody has to be equal and all that, and I'm not saying anything against that. I'm just saying that, it, but the one person that gave more freedom to ladies than anybody else was the Lord Jesus Christ. Because before Jesus came, they were second-class citizens. Before Jesus came, they could not walk with their husband in public. When they walked in public, they had to walk behind him. They could not talk to their husband in public. They could not speak. They could not own anything. They could not have anything in their name. That's where Sarah's born and raised at in that kind of living. But when Jesus came, he lifted that up. How many women in the Bible did Jesus talk to in public? A lot of them. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible is the story of the woman at the well that came and Jesus sat there waiting on her. That's one of my favorite in the Bible that I love to teach and love to preach. That is such a great... Nobody else would talk to her, but Jesus talked to her. Jesus did more than the governments or anything else will do for ladies and, 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 the, and who they are today began when Jesus came. So Sarah, as we'll talk about this. Now the Bible teaches this. I want to take you, this is a scripture. I, I looked this up uh, today while I was at the office because I hadn't looked it up in a while. But I looked it up. When I do weddings, which, you know, I don't do many anymore, and, and, and that's fine with me. That's really, really good with me. But I have to do them every once in a while, and, and so I do. And, 
And but when I always do counseling before I do the wedding. And this is a scripture that I've always used, talking about the relationship of the wife and the husband. And it's found over in the book of 1 Peter. And I'll use this. And it's biblical because it's in the Bible. And I'm going to read it to you. But in 1 Peter, the third chapter, in the beginning of verse 1, it says this, talking about wives. Remember the times that this is written in now. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. I can give you my interpretation of that, and that is this. Everybody that gets married are both saved or one saved or none saved. But ladies, let me tell you, God gives you one of the greatest compliments right here that he does in the Bible. And every time I read this scripture, it is the story of my life. Because when I married my wife, I was not saved. I, I was, didn't go to church. Church was not a thing, not only not a priority, it wasn't even in my vocabulary, it was church. But when I met Lynn and we married, she'd always, her daddy had raised her, and she'd always been in church all her life. And you've heard my story. In the first many years we were married, I didn't go to church. I had other things to do that I thought were more important. But she did. She, in spite of me, she went. And as my boys come along, she carried them when I wouldn't go. And she lived in front of me a life that I had not witnessed so close before of following the Lord. It says, if a, you have a husband that has not obeyed the word. That's what it said. That was me. See, this, this is a personal scripture to me. That he may, without hearing the word, be won by the conversation of who? His wife. The story of my life was my wife set the example for me, did not let me dissuade her from going to church. And I watched that, and it began to change my life as I grew up. And it says, while they, who is they? The husbands. Behold their chaste conversation coupled with fear. When they listen to them. When I listen to my wife tell our boys Bible stories at night. Stories that I didn't know anything about. She did not know that that would affect our marriage, and our family later on in our life. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair and the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. God said, just looking good on the outside will not make a marriage. Having fancy stuff will not make a marriage. It's just like it won't make a Christian. It's always going to be what's on the inside. The Bible says that God looks at where? The heart. God doesn't look at what you and I are wearing tonight. God looks inside of us and sees where our heart is tonight. And that's what he says. But he says, don't let it be the outward look. A lot of people, I had the outward look for a long time, even if I started going to church, but it wasn't real. But God knew the inward here. But, let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. That what is on the inside is what's worth something. He said that's what's on the inside of you is of a great price. Why? Because it costs a lot. What's inside of you if you're a child of God was very expensive cost God the most precious thing he had. So he says what's inside is a great price. 
For after this manner in the old time, the holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Now you make no bones about this, whether you like or don't like it. God has called the husband. I did not fit this form in my home for a long time. But God has always called the husband to be the spiritual leader of that house. It was not my wife's place to take those kids to church. It was my place. But I never learned that for a long time until I started going and and saw a difference it was making and made. But I understand and then I look at the word. It says, and then it goes on. And This is the verse. Look at verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Adam, Abraham. See, that's what kicked off women's live right there, that word obey. (laughs) As Sarah obeyed Adam, I mean, as she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. What she was saying, see, people will take that and people that are on the whatever side you want to be on, we'll look at that and say that the women have to worship the, 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 their mate and all that. When it says she called him Lord, do you, you do not see a capital L in that, do you? No. She recognized him as supposedly being the head of the family, that, she, that he was in subject to God, and she, and she was to work. Remember when I told you about Eve and God said they were a help meet to one another where one was weak, the other was strong, so on and so forth. But it would always be the man that God had put as the head of the home, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them in knowledge, giving honor to your wife. This is what I tell people when I cancel there's a man that loves you like God loves you, if there's a man in your life that acknowledges you and gives honor to you as a weaker vessel, as heirs together of the grace of life, then you know what? If you get a man like that, you should have no problem letting him be the head of the house. If he loves you like God loves you, if he honors you, if he treats you like you ought to be treated, then you should have no fault letting him be the head. But that's the kind of man he said you to follow. Now, getting back, and he, and he mentioned two people's names in there. Who were who? Sarah and Abraham. So who did Peter use as the example here in marriage? As example, two people of faith that are listed in the book of faith in the Bible, a husband and wife named Sarah and Abraham. Were they a perfect husband? No. Was she the perfect wife? No. Did they both mess it up? Yes, they did. Did they mess it up together? Yes, they did. But God don't throw away the clay. Isn't that our theme? God don't throw away the clay, thank God. If he just threw it away on Sarah and Abraham... Because the first thing they did was blow it. God called them. You know the story. We talked about it, how God put the call on Abraham's heart to uh, to go to a place where he would lead him and to take his wife and his family and to go there. God placed that on Abraham. Remember, they were Chaldeans. They They were in a pagan land. And yet God, for some reason, whatever reason he chose, you just think about this. We're in the Christmas season, and you think about it. Of all the people that lived on the face of the earth, why Mary and Joseph? Why could it not have been somebody else? Well, we think about that with them, but how about this? Why Abraham? Why Abraham? He was a pagan. He was an enemy of the people of God. Why him? I always, when I don't know the answer, this is my answer. 
My ways are not his ways. <laughs> That's what he said. Don't figure it out. Don't worry about it. Just accept it, Jimmy. When I look, that's the man I wanted. When I look, Mary and Joseph were the one I wanted. He don't have to explain it to me. I love that story of Mary and Joseph as I love this story here. But what happens is this. Let's, let's read a little bit here. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, let's begin verse 8. And he removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel, pitched his tent. Having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. I want you to remember that little last part of that verse right there. That's very important to where we end up at here. Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. Remember what God told Abraham when he called him. You have to go where I lead you. I'm not telling you where you're going, but if you're going to follow me, you've got to take, go wherever I tell you to. Abraham said he would do that. But then something happened. Life changes, doesn't it? They're traveling. Things are good. Then they go to the place south. They go around and they find out, you know what? There's a famine in the land that God has sent them to. Was that an accident or was that a purpose? God don't have accidents. There's a reason here. There was famine in the land, and Abram went down. I want you to notice something in the Bible when it talks about Egypt in the Bible. Most always it will say, down to Egypt. They went down to Egypt. You don't find hardly anywhere. I don't know if there's anywhere in the Bible where it says they went up to Egypt. Maybe. I, I, but most times... When you mention Egypt, which was a pagan land, it was always down. And he went down to Egypt to sojourn there, to stay there, for the famine was grievous in the land where they had been. They, it, so they went down there. And it came to pass that when he was come near unto Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look at. I hope he told her that before now, don't you? You know what he said? Honey, you're a good looking woman. Are we going to a place? I just want you to know I think you're about the prettiest woman I ever seen. That's what he's saying to her here. But this is what's got to happen because you are so good looking. Therefore it shall come to pass that when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will save thee. If I go down amongst those heathens down there in Egypt, and they see how pretty you are, and they know I'm your husband, they will kill me so they can have you. They have no morals. They have no ethics. They don't care. They just see a pretty woman. They get rid of the one that, that's her husband. Don't have to deal with him anymore. So I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. And my soul shall live because of thee. Who was he putting his faith in here? His wife, wasn't he? What did he say? My soul shall live because of who? You. When we get down into Egypt, honey, how you address this situation and things they ask, whether I'm going to live or die is on you. So we see a big mistake here. A oh, big mistake with that statement right there. Huge mistake right there, which we'll learn about as we go along. So the princes of Pharaoh saw her, and they commended her before Pharaoh. They went to Pharaoh and said, what? You can believe about the most beautiful woman we've ever seen just came into town. 
She's hot. That's what they'd say today. She's hot. <laughs> Pharaoh, you need to see her. They were bragging on her. And the woman was taken unto Pharaoh's house. And he entreated her, ask Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep, oxen, asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a swap with you. I got wealth at the end now. Whoever this woman is here, if you let me have her, I give you livestock, I'll give you money, I'll give you whatever you want to make it a legit deal here. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. What happens here? Thank God that when we mess it up sometimes, God intervenes doesn't he? and keeps us from going too far. You ever thought about that? Maybe you might have messed it up, but what if you'd have kept going in that direction where you were going? And God hadn't come in and, and picked you up and helped you get back on the road again. How far down would you have gone? What would it have cost you at the end of time had God not showed up and helped you there? God heard the conversation between Pharaoh and Abel. God comes in and says, I'll stop this before it gets started. So the night they get Sarah, and they're going to take her to Pharaoh, the roof caves in. What happens in the land? The Lord sent a plague. Not only a plague, but he says in that scripture, great plagues because of one reason, Sarah. Well, Pharaoh's not done. I was just think about this for a minute. Everything's going good with, with Pharaoh in Egypt right now until these cats show up. Everybody else starving. Ain't got nothing. Pharaoh and them, they, they got a land of plenty, and all of a sudden. Sarah and Abraham walk in, and what happens? Plagues start coming down. The food gets cut off. The money gets cut off. All of a sudden, when she shows up and he shows up, everything goes to the dogs. So Pharaoh sits back and says, What in the world has changed so quickly? Why were we here today and down here tomorrow? Pharaoh figures it out. And he calls Abram and he said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? And why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? It's amazing to me that here's a pagan Pharaoh that begins to understand a spiritual thing, that it was God that was causing this. And it all came because of a lie that he told his wife to tell. A lie that why did you not tell me that she was your wife. So, Pharaoh puts the blame where the blame needs to go. Because who had told her to lie? He had. He had told her to lie for him because he said, what did he tell her when he told her that? Because my life depends on you telling a lie for me. That's exactly what he said. What did he say? If they find out I'm your husband, they will kill me. So you lie for me. 
So he does, and she did, and she lied for him. Now what we need to find out, because this is where we're going with this. Now the, 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 the theme of this next two or three weeks is we'll be talking about Sarah is the woman of faith in the Bible. How much faith do you see going on here? On her part or his part? None. Zero. None. Whatsoever do you see here? Why did you say she's my sister? That I might have taken her to be my wife. I, he, he says, you know how serious this could have been? I could have married her, and she's already married to you. Now, back then, that wouldn't have been a really big deal. When I'm amazed at this is, and I don't understand all this. I'd take a preacher smart of me to figure this out. In the Bible, ain't never been a problem about how many wives you have, has there? In the Bible, couldn't you have many as you want, especially if you was a pagan king? So many people in the Bible had many wives. So why a big deal here? Why did he think this was a big deal? He probably had many. But he knew there was something special about her. He knew whether God revealed it to him or whatever happened there. He said, why sayest thou she is my sister? Well, let me, let me go ahead and tell you about that right quick. Now i got to finish. That wasn't a full lie. That was a half lie. She was his wife, but she was really his half-sister too. Go back to the genealogies of them. You'll find that that was his half-sister. So, truth be told, he, he did a, what did say, Mr. Cole? He did a little fib. There. He, just, he, he just didn't tell the whole truth, did he? What did he say? That? Well, a little white lie. She's my sister. Well, in essence, that was a truth that was there. I might have taken her for my wife now. So here we go to the now. I'm going to tell you, when God. I want to tell you, have you, have you not always heard this? When God calls you to do a job or God calls you to do something, he always prepares and takes care of whatever you need to do it. Isn't that right? Don't he always do that? This is kind of God stepping in here in a God way, and I can't understand. I can't even begin to understand all that. I know it by heart. Behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. I want to tell you something. If Pharaoh had wanted to, he could have made things a whole lot more difficult than he did right there. He could have killed him. He could have killed her. He could have done anything he wanted to do. But you see an intervention of God, a holy God in here, that had a plan for Abraham and Sarah. So what they didn't know or were scared of, or they wouldn't have lied, was this. That God called them for a very specific task in the whole Bible, this task that he called them to do. That places them in the protective hand of God. In his protective hand. For God's promises to Abraham. Remember all the promises he made him. If you do this, if you do this. God was going to see in his own divine way, that it happened like he wanted it to. And the last verse says that Pharaoh commanded his wife concerning him. They sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Abraham did not lose one thing by going there. Whatever he had, and Abraham was a rich man now. Abraham didn't really need Pharaoh's herds and his money and all because Abraham was very wealthy himself. And even though he, God is too good to us sometimes, 
even though he lied, disavowed his wife, the Bible says he left there with exactly what he went there with. God protected him. God provided for him. Now let's look at this and we'll close. I, want, I just want to take it. Look, look at verse, uh, this is just a point I made to you earlier. Look at verse 1 of chapter 13. Remember when I, I told you most time in the Bible when it talks of Egypt in respect to Egypt, it will always say down. Look what it says in verse 13. Abraham went up out of Egypt. To get into Egypt, he had to go down. I've heard preachers say this all my life, that Egypt represents the world in the Bible. And he had to go up to get out of there. To get back to where God wanted him to be, he had, and all that he had, and lot with him, he left there. That is the historical... Now, were both of them in the wrong? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. They were both wrong. He was wrong. She was wrong because they both lied or half lied or, or whatever. But I'll tell you what, the biggest, when I look at it, and you know when preachers read stories like this, they have their own perspective of things. This is my perspective of that. It was not the lie. It was the fact that he went there where he had no business going. Folks, if you get in the devil's playhouse, you're going to be somewhere you got no business going, and more than likely it's going to cost you. It didn't cost him much. It could have cost him a lot. But you know one thing. You see two lies here. And I've heard this all my life. You don't ever want to tell a lie. Because to get out of it or cover it up, you have to tell another lie. So the best thing is tell the truth. Two lies. But what if they had just trusted God? When they went into the land where the famine was, God had already made him promises Faith, this is the story of Abraham and Sarah, and this is the story of everybody. Faith has to grow. It is times like these that you go through that will cause your faith to grow. Their faith was not strong enough to remember the promises of God when he said, I'm going to take you to a land where you're there, and you will prosper, and I'm going to make it everywhere, wherever you put your foot at. It's going. His faith wasn't ready for that yet. This here was the first step in the growth of faith in a man named Abraham. And listen, there were a lot of things coming up in their life ahead. And you know the thing about it? I'll tell you when faith grows, and I can tell you, for example, from experience. Faith grows more when you're in Egypt than when you're out of Egypt sometimes. When you're down instead of up, that will cause your faith to grow. God knows that. It's just a, a proven fact. And I was reading this in a, a book that I got the other day. That more, And I'm going to just use the terminology of the scripture we used here. And that is more people will pray when they're in Egypt than when they're out of Egypt. People will get closer to God when they're in Egypt than when they're out of Egypt and everything's going hunky-dory in their life. We'll get lax in our prayer time, in our, our work. And I, said, we'll, I want to tell you something. When the world's caving in around and you don't have to answer anything, I'll tell you what you'll do. you spend more time in prayer hoping that God is going to do what he says he's going to do than if everything just always goes smooth in your life. Abraham 
right off the go, his faith was tested. Now, I think this, and I could be wrong on this. I don't think God had to test Abraham or Sarah to find out how much faith they had. God knows everything, don't he? But sometimes we need to be tested to know how much, that we know how much faith we got. How much can I trust God? When God takes you through a, you know, I've told you stories of my life. I'm, I'm a very open preacher. Y'all know much about my family, about as much as I do. But I, I, I'm just touch this. But I, y'all heard me tell a story of my little boy, Scott, was lost. Dark like this in the woods with a big pond behind our house where we lived at. Remember what I told you? When I knelt down by that old commode back there. Sheriff's out there, the, the, the fire department's out there, and all the people in the county, they all over them woods looking for my little boy. God's out there too. When you don't know where to go, you go by an old commode where ain't nobody going to look for you, and you get down on your knees and you lean on that thing and say, God, please find my boy. Boy, don't let him be drowned in that pond back there. Remember what I told you? As soon as I walked out of the house on the front porch, what did they say? We got him. That helps your faith grow so when you come like what you've been through in the last little, you, you know God's done done it one time. See, this is just the first step in the test of faith for Sarah and them. You got to have that first test because there are tougher tests coming than this. Tougher than this. All right. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you. Don't forget this Sunday night is we're going to have our church supper uh, here at the church. We ask you to bring uh, covered dishes. We want to have a big crowd. The church will su- supply all the, the meat and things we're going to have. We just need covered dish and, and drinks and desserts and so on and forth. And we'll have a good Christmas supper uh, here at the church Sunday night. Thank you all for being with us. God bless you. If your faith gets tried, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just tell you. We talk a lot about this after y'all will leave us because we have prayer time. But folks, take it from a preacher that knows faith works. Prayer works. Don't ever give up on prayer. Thank you for being with us.